Okay, hello YouTube. Uh, today I'm going to be doing the beginnings of my series on how to play uh, against pawn to e4, and what I'm going to be recommending is pawn to e5. And before we get going, uh, if you do like this kind of content and you want to see more, uh, please go ahead and hit that like button, hit subscribe, and hit your notification icon. So anyways, e5 has got to be one of the most versatile weapons against e4 on the planet, and it's probably one of the most heavily explored. A vast, the majority of games goes e4, e5. Now, even though e4, e5 is this heavily explored tabia of chess, it's also a place where a lot of very interesting and very new ideas can still get explored. Not everything has been explored to death, and people still get shocked by a lot of new ideas and a lot of new concepts. So there's a lot of possibilities that you have to be prepared for when you play a move like e5. You have to be prepared to play against the King's Gambit, you have to be prepared to play against the Danish, you have to be prepared to play against the Vienna, you even have to be prepared to play against off-the-wall tries, stuff like um, the Ponziani, or stuff like the Bishop's opening. So you have to have preparation against all of this, and I'm going to be trying to go over all of these openings throughout this series. The main thing we're going to be focusing on right now is the main line with knight f3, and I'm going to be recommending the move knight to c6, and now you're going to have to reckon with basically four main moves. You have to reckon with bishop c4, bishop b5, and you have to reckon with d4, and of course you also have to reckon with, you know, the possibility of the four knights, especially on the lower levels. You have to reckon with the move knight to c3, and then of course you can play a four knights, or you can even play a three knights against knight to c3. So you have to reckon with these four main possibilities, d4, bishop c4, bishop b5, and knight c3. These are basically the four main moves that you have to deal with. So in other videos, we're going to spend time talking about uh, bishop b5. I actually do a video on the martial attack, which I'm going to be recommending against against e4. So I would refer you to that video if you want to at least learn something about uh, how to play against the Roy Lopez. Uh, we'll talk about how to play against the Scotch. We'll talk about how to play against the Four Knights. The main focus of this video is going to, how to be how to play against bishop to c4. And what I'm going to be recommending is the move bishop to c5. Now, you do have three options here. Like I said, e4, e5, it's one of the most versatile weapons in chess. You can really choose your defense. So if you want to be an expert in the two knights defense, you can play the two knights defense here. If you want to make yourself an expert in the Hungarian defense, you can play the Hungarian here with bishop e7, or you can play this joko piano with the move bishop to c5. Now the ball is back in white's court, and as you can see, there's a lot of options here. White can play the main line Joko Piano or Molar attack with a move like c3. White can play an Evans Gambit with a move like d b4. Or white can play the so-called quiet game with the move d3. Now, when I was doing my research for this video, I originally thought that this was just one of the most misplayed openings on the scholastic level until I started researching Grandmaster games, and I started going over those Grandmaster games with engines, and I started looking at some of the games, and I started looking at some of the mistakes, and I came to realize that this is probably just one of the most misplayed positions in chess, period. And there's a good reason for it. It's because the position is deceptively simple, and yet there's actually a lot going on. So one of the main ideas that Grandmasters have when they play this is they want to play the move pawn to c3, and they want to play the move d4, and they want to get their pawn duo in the middle of the board. So basically, when grandmasters play the quiet game, what they're trying to do is they're trying to play a Roy Lopez without all of the theory, right? They're trying to play it without having to play all of the well-trodden paths of the Roy Lopez. So it makes sense with everybody doing all of these maneuvers to avoid theory that people are bound to make mistakes, especially if they start getting in positions where they're kind of on their own. And also, the position is deceptively uh, simple. You would think this is the only thing going on. White's going to try to play c3 and d4, and black's going to try to do stuff to stop him. So if that's the case, then on the grandmaster level, and it is one of the most popular moves, we should just immediately put some pressure on knight f with knight f6 to put some pressure on e4 and prevent c3 and d4. And certainly knight f6 is a good move for this reason, because that is white's main strategy, is to play um, pawn to c3 and pawn to d4. But what's interesting is there are other things going on in this position. For one thing, 
There are strategic ideas revolving around whether or not each side could play something like h6 and g5 or h3 and g4, which is going to depend a lot on whether or not each side has castled and whether or not each side has control over their respective d4 and d5 squares. So there's this concept in chess, and it's, it's an old, old basic principle is a attack on the wing is countered by an attack in the center. But something that people don't seem to understand is there's a color, uh, corollary to that concept. I know I just butchered that word, which is if you can't counter in the center, you can't stop a wing attack, right? So a wing attack is countered by an attack in the center. But if you cannot counter in the center, so if the center is blocked or if your opponent controls the central squares, like if they control this d4 square, if you cannot counter in the center somehow, their wing attack is essentially unstoppable. And this is the type of mistake I see on the amateur level all the time, which is why with kids and other amateurs I recommend the move d6, because a lot of kids will immediately start giving up control of their d4 square. And with kids I recommend the move bishop to g4, because a lot of kids don't realize that this is really, really important. So if they started recognizing danger, they need to fight back now. They need to play a move like h3 immediately, which is why I think in higher level competition, probably the move knight to f6 is maybe a little bit better than bishop g4, even at this stage. Although once somebody plays knight c3, they're already kind of demonstrating a lack of understanding of what they're trying to do, because this knight is going to probably be happier maneuvering to d2 putting the pawn on c3, and then maneuvering this knight someplace more useful like either g3 or possibly e3, so that we can aim at the d5 or f5 squares, much like we would see in a Roy Lopez. Knight c3 is kind of a, a ridiculously aggressive move, trying to play the moves knight c3 and d5, and then following up with the move pawn to c3, and then declaring that you've managed to save all of this knight maneuvering. And the reason that's almost comically ridiculous is because, of course, Black can counter this all by simply bringing his knight to f6 and capturing the knight as soon as it lands on d5. So we we have all of this stuff going on. So like I know I've drawn a lot of arrows, but a lot of people, um, especially um, amateurs and beginners and, and players of lower ratings, will make the move castles kingside, not realizing that the d4 square has completely been given up, and then knight to d4, and you would think after a move like bishop e3 white would be okay because look at how much development white has and look at white being castled but white cannot counter in the middle of the board the center of the board is blocked that means that white has no way to counter a wing attack in this position this is a very basic chess concept so black actually is winning the game here black can play knight f3 gf3 bishop h3 just attacking the king in a very crude way and then removing this defender on e3 to bring his queen to g5 and g2 with mate. So it will be now bishop e3, and then queen g5, and then queen g2 is going to be mate. So this is a concept. And this is an important concept to understand. You can get away with knight c3. You can get away with castle's kingside in this position as white, but you can't get away with both. And this rule actually applies to, to, to black as well. Black also has to be very careful about this. So there's certain move orders, even after the move, say, knight f6, that we also have to be very careful about with the black pieces. So after the move knight f6, for example, if they were to play a move like bishop g5, we have to be very cautious about castling before our opponent has castled in this position very cautious about it. Or we simply have to attack this bishop right away. We have to play a move like h6. Actually, after knight f6, bishop g5, h6, bishop f6, queen f6, um, and then say knight c3, aiming after d5. Probably the best move here is just knight e7, controlling that d5 square. And black is actually doing quite well here. Um, black is doing just fine. Notice we haven't castled, but also notice that we took care of this pin immediately. And then we made sure to safeguard the d5 square. The number of times this type of position gets played, even on higher levels, is kind of shocking. Because there is more than one fight going on here. There's, of course, a fight for c3 and d4. But there's also a fight to make sure that you don't have a position that, be that can become a victim to a wing attack. 
And this is a very fundamental basic principle concept of chess. And we have to be very cautious about it. So if we were to wait and we were to do something like castles, we're going to fall under very similar problems. So like, for example, knight c3, d6, knight d5. This would be a similarly winning position to the one that we just saw. We would actually have no way of surviving an attack after, say, knight f6, g f6, bishop h6, followed by knight h4. And we have pretty much the exact same concept of all of these white pieces flying into the king side. And we also will run out of the option to play moves like, say, h6 and g5, because the white king has not castled yet. So that's another important concept, is if we were to play something like, say, h6, and then after this bishop retreated, we continued with a move like g5, our kingside position is completely destroyed. And since this king hasn't committed yet, we have no problem using our pawns, using our rook, and actually bringing the queen to d2 and castling queenside to completely destroy the position of the black king. And unfortunately, I actually saw this this this, this game unfold at, at the, the, the grandmaster level. I saw this game unfold one time. This was actually played once, or something very similar to it was played at the grandmaster level, where black played h6 and g5 before white had committed his king to the kingside or the queenside, and of course, while it was completely impossible for black to counter in the center with a move like d5, which it often is um, in the Joko piano with bishop c5. So these are things we have to be cautious about. These are things we have to be careful about. And these are things we have to keep in mind when we're playing this position with black. So the move that I recommend for, for most club players is going to be d6. And then, of course, the... The, the big move that most people are going to play here is they're going to play c3, or they're going to play castles, or they're going to play, um, you know, knight c3. Now, against knight c3, I would certainly quiz them with bishop g4, although in any case, the move knight f6 is really supposed to be the best move after you've played the move pawn to d6. So d6, and let's say um, castles. At this point, bishop g4 would kind of be a mistake if they immediately play c3, and now our bishop is feeling kind of misplaced because they will be able to counter in the center with a move like d4 later. So this should be advantage white. So after either castles or I would say probably the most accurate move is c3, I would say we're going to be following up with knight f6. And of course, the reason we play knight f6 is we're putting pressure on that e4 pawn, and that's preventing white from playing pawn to d4 himself. So the game we're following is... Um, uh, a game between uh, Van Forest and um, Ding Liren. And this game is kind of interesting because I feel I have mixed feelings about this game. I feel like each side actually made some mistakes, but not in the opening itself. I feel like each side showed the concepts and the ideas exceptionally well in the opening, but I feel a little bit later, I feel Van Forest missed his opportunity to keep an advantage with white. So the game continued castles, castles, Ricky won a5. This is all very correct. We're creating a retreat square for our bishop. This is basically what black does. He's preventing d4, and he's preparing to meet um, ideas with other ideas. So bishop g5, he kicks the bishop. And of course, Ding Liren says, well, we're both castled kingside, and uh, so I should be able to play g5 without much difficulty. And of course, Van Forest is going to try to counter in the middle because Ding Liren is now attacking on the wing. So bishop g3, uh, knight h7, continuing with a wing-style attack, and then d4 countering in the middle. This makes perfect sense. So now um, Van Forest is going to be trying to play stuff like h4, possibly queen d2, knight d2, knight f1. And meanwhile, Ding Liren is going to have to prove that his kingside attack is going to be acceptable, and more importantly, that he can hold his center together. So now bishop b6, d e5, h5, he's going after this kingside attack. H4 is forced here, so I think that was very good. Bishop g4, knight d2, knight e5, bishop back to e2, takes, 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 takes. And then right here, I feel like he made his only real mistake in the game, but conceptually it was absolutely the right move. He played e5 and immediately started hitting at the center, which from a, a classical point of view, this is exactly what you're supposed to do. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for tactical reasons. Um, Ding Liren is able to play the move queen h4, and he got a pretty vicious attack, and things went well for him, and Ding Liren actually ended up winning this game. He should have actually continued with the move bishop takes h5 here instead of e5, 
with the idea of bringing his queen into g4. So if queen g5, he's going to play queen g4, and that's going to exchange off the pieces, and that's going to get rid of the attack. And then after f5, queen g5, knight g5, now we play e5, striking at the middle. And I feel like white has a very slight edge here. Black's pawns are a little bit weaker. White has the bishop pair, and white should be a little bit better. So that gives you an idea of, of what's possible for each side in these positions, in these so-called quiet positions, and these strategic positions where each side can maybe attack the king's side or maybe attack the center on their own without a lot of other stuff going on. Now, what amazes me is the number of players that, that, that I thought are, are like... Um, super strong players that actually made some very interesting mistakes. So there was a game actually that was played between um, Newton and Magnus Carlsen in Dubai in 2014. And this game also was riddled with, with quite a few errors. So this game went knight f6, knight on b to d2, which again, this is the normal type of Rui Lopez type of strategy of playing knight on b to d2, c3, etc. So Magnus Carlsen just plays regular chess, and we should follow Magnus Carlsen the way he plays the opening because he's very good at just playing solid moves in the middle. He's got experience in openings like the Berlin, which is very similar to the quiet game. So we have c3 and we have this Berlin-esque type position in the quiet game, and we're going to have castles, castles, which is fine for both sides, bishop e6, bishop b3. So there's this kind of dance that goes on here. We play bishop e6 and we say, hey, I'd really like for you to take, and that would be a horrible mistake. And that's another beginner mistake I see a lot, is they'll take on e6, and then when the pawn takes back, this really improves black's control over the f5 and d5 squares. It improves black's control over the center, and it opens up the f-file for the rook. And after this happens, I would say that black is actually the one that's a little bit better. We have complete control of d5. And as noted before, if we control the center, all of a sudden white can't counter the wing attack. So this is a very basic principle thing is once you control the center, they can't counter the wing attack. So there's this, this underlying thing going on under the surface that falls back on the most basic principles of chess that is deeper than just, we're going to play this Roy Lopez strategy and try to play c3 and d4, even though that is the, the primary strategy here. So bishop back to b3, and then we have um, Magnus Carlsen plays bishop takes b3, and I was a little shocked um, Yudin played uh, queen b3, but it turned out to actually be a pretty good decision. He's going out for the light squares as opposed to taking back with the a pawn. Um, my chess pedigree and my chess experience tells me to take back with the a pawn because, again, that attacks the center of the board and opens up the rook file. Generally, taking back with the a pawn in situations like this is the more beneficial way to go. But... The game went rook b8, knight c4, queen d7, bishop e3. So as you can see, we're just going after the middle of the board. And then, I don't know, maybe the notation's wrong or something like this, but the game continued b5 is what Magnus Carlsen played. And then you then retreated, missing a huge opportunity in the middle of the board, which just gives you an idea. It's just because these positions are sometimes just a little strange and a little bit awkward for people, and they're not familiar with all of the tactics as they normally should be. They make these mistakes even at the highest levels. He actually missed a shot here, Magnus Carlsen did when he played b5, and white could have gotten a huge advantage. So take a second, pause the video, and see if you can find it. And of course, that move is knight on c captures e5, which amazingly works because the bishop is hanging on c5. So this is just maybe a tactic that he's just a little bit, he's not used to it, right? This doesn't happen in the Royal Lopez, this doesn't really happen in the Berlin. That this isn't a, a tactic that comes up, but it comes up in the quiet game. So there's there your own unique problems kind of in the quiet game. So you could have played knight on c to e5 here, and then like say after all of this, we're just up a pawn and we're up material. So these are the kinds of things you have to watch out for when you're defending here with black. So so what um, should have Carlson done, you know, differently? Well, any number of things, right? He could have, uh, of course, exchanged, although that would help out, you know, White's position quite a bit. Or he could have, you know, retreated his bishop back to, to b6 and avoid the tactic on his bishop. So he had options available to him to, to continue to try to play chess from here. So, again, going back to what we're talking about here with, with c3, I'm going to get recommending knight to f6, and then we're going to have um, another possibility here is bishop to b3, we could castle, and then bishop g5, 
and then a move like h6, bishop h4, and what don't we play here? We don't play g5. So this was the Grandmaster game I was talking about. This was Agenstein versus Hammer in Oslo, Norway in 2014. I remember I, I said that there was actually a Grandmaster game where somebody played g5, bishop g3, and they did this before they had castled. And sure enough, white did exactly what I was talking about. White played queen d2, and then white proceeded to castle queenside, and white basically played h4 and broke everything up, and it happened really quickly. Uh, after bishop g4, h3, bishop h5, h4 got played, g4, knight h2, knight e7, knight d2. Notice what he hasn't done, he hasn't castled kingside. And, and this is the big oopsie moment. White castles queenside, and of course this is just, this is death over here. This is all falling apart. Black isn't prepared to counter in the middle of the board. He tries desperately to. He realizes his mistake, and he tries desperately to correct it with moves like b5, and then knight e3, and then bishop takes e3, queen e3, a5, f3, takes, takes, but he's getting destroyed here. And eventually, um, Agenstein went on to win. I'll show you the rest of the game real quick. Black tries to drum up some counterplay on the queen side. It's all pretty much unsuccessful because the king side is basically just falling apart. And after h5, you know, Black resigned. Okay, so what do I recommend against, um, you know, a move like a move like bishop b3? Well, you can castle bishop g5, and then after h6, bishop h4, simply don't play the move g5, right? We have to do something else. Or simply delay castling and don't do any of that stuff. You have to be more cautious. So you can play knight f6, and they can play bishop g5, and if they play bishop g5, I would play h6 right away and put that question to the bishop before they castle. Another thing you can actually do is you can actually play h6 in these positions um, ahead of time, and it's perfectly acceptable. So after, say, d6, and after we have this uh, pawn to c3, and then after we play knight f6, and after they play a move like bishop b3, there's no law against playing the move h6 here. And it's actually perfectly acceptable. It's, it's a move that actually gets played uh, quite a bit, and it's a perfectly acceptable move. You can also play another safety move here. You can play the move a6, and you can give yourself room for this bishop, and then say after castles, you can even play the move bishop a7. And then after knight on b to d2, now you can finally castle. This is a much more common position. And notice that both sides are castled now, and notice that bishop g5 is off. So there are ways to play these positions properly and appropriately to avoid making these fundamental strategic errors, right? So what is um, Black's overall concept here? What is the overall like STEM game of, of, of what we can do uh, right or what we can do correctly? So, so one example here would be this particular game that went Knight f6, h3, h6, and the game we're following is um, Nixon's versus Ivanchuk in Warsaw, Poland in 2010. And that game went a3, bishop b6. Notice Ivanchuk really, that's the one thing I love about Ivanchuk is some people think Ivanchuk is crazy. Uh, Ivanchuk really understands positional chess. He really understands what's going on. He's focusing his control on d5. He's not castling too early. He's playing safety moves like bishop b6 and h6. He understands what is happening in the position, and he seems to understand it better than any other player in the world, which is one of the reasons that he's able to upset world champions sometimes with strategic ideas. So knight b6, a b6, castles, castles. He waited till his opponent castled, then he castled. And of course now, Ivanchuk can play g5 because he can counter in the center just as easily as white can, and they are both castled kingside. So this is perfectly acceptable. Queen f3 gets played, king g7, he holds, he exchanges, queen d7, he's going after that pawn, g4, so now both people have weakened the kingside, but black has better control of the middle. So Ivan Chuck now has the advantage. So he plays queen c6, and actually white probably should have exchanged queens. I don't think he realizes that he's in trouble. So the queens do eventually get exchanged, though. And as you can see here, black is actually just doing a little bit better. He's got extra, he's got basically what amounts to an extra pawn on the queen side. He's got a rook on the seventh rank, and he's got a slightly better position tonight. And Ivan Chuck was able to eke out a win here in the endgame. And I know this is kind of boring, like eking out a win in the endgame, but notice the themes. He's got better central control better rooks, 
he was able to take over that middle of the board and he was able to keep it. And that's what's happening. That is the strategic concept of what's happening. So just showing the rest of this game, how it made all those ideas work, and Black, of course, went on to win. So this is how you play the quiet game. And I know it's difficult. You have to pay attention to what your opponent does. You have to pay attention to whether or not your opponent's castled or not. You have to pay attention to whether or not they're getting ready to play c3 and d4. And then you have to put pressure on e4. And it's difficult. I think the reason it's difficult is because it's a deceptively simple position. You think white has one plan, but actually there's multiple plans in the position that do blend into each other, and we do have to keep track of them, and we have to keep track of what's going on. So the easiest way to put this, kind of in conclusion of all of this, is it's okay to play a bunch of safety moves in the Joko Piano. You can play knight f6, h6, a6, bishop a7, or bishop b6 before you do anything that's going to truly make a huge um, impact on the position. You know, before you do something like that seems mundane, like castling and then playing h6 and g5, for example, right? Before you do something like that, you can make these safety moves and you can make sure that nothing goes wrong on a very basic fundamental principle level of chess. So anyway, so this is how you should play against uh, the quiet game with bishop c5. And anyways, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess. And if you like this kind of content, uh, please go ahead and um, smash that subscribe button. Thank you very much for watching.